Chapter Eighteen of Rough Justice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rough Justice by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter Eighteen: What He Meant to Do arnold was not an invited guest at lady violet's wedding but he was an attentive spectator of the ceremony among the idle young ladies who had got wind of the marriage and the nurses who had dropped in on seeing the carriages drive to the church door and the red carpet laid in readiness for satin-shod feet the nurses condemned the whole function as a shabby affair but were agreed that the bride looked as beautiful as a statue and carried herself like a queen she was not one of those crying brides whom the nurses spoke of contemptuously as not knowing their own minds and spoiling their looks with red eyelids and upsetting everybody nor was she one of those voiceless brides who open tremulous lips and gasp like a fish when called upon to utter the words that mean fate low and clear and distinctly audible were her answers to the fateful questions and even the furthest off among the nursemaids heard and approved that firm utterance arnold heard her from his place in the shelter of clustered columns heard her with an aching heart truth love beauty purity all were being given to a man whose guilt-stained soul he knew and he had done nothing to save her it would have been useless he told himself she would not have believed me what woman would believe a stranger in opposition to the man she loves love is deaf as well as blind illogical wrong-headed love is love no i should but have made a false move spoilt my own game and saved her not one pang she must dree her weird mary freeland and mrs tresillian smith were among the wedding guests a somewhat premature present from mrs smith having reversed the order of the game and produced the invitation card in response to the gift instead of the gift in response to the invitation mary was wearing her bridesmaid's frock and hat and was looking prettier to-day in her unconsciousness of arnold's vicinity than she had looked at the former wedding when her pale cheeks and air of offended pride clouded her frank english beauty mary's was a beauty made for happiness a delightful aurora or hebe but a very poor model for electra or antigone they were married the low-born money-lender's grandson and violet the daughter of a man whose distinguished lineage was forgotten in the lustre of his benevolence philanthropy public speaking sympathy with the working man had done this thing for oliver greswold and there were cynics who had watched his career and envied him his talents and who now went about saying that he had made philanthropy pay bride and bridegroom went to italy for their honeymoon they were bound first for sorrento travelling by easy stages and after seeing naples sicily and capri they were going back to finish their holiday in rome only returning to england in time for oliver to stand for a certain east in constituency in a district where his triumphant return was a foregone conclusion the present member was a distinguished lawyer expectant of being raised to the bench and there was very little doubt that the seat would be vacant before long and thus arnold's enemy vanished out of his ken while the chain of evidence was still incomplete and arnold sadly missing his friend wilmot walked about london idle and discontented fit neither for work nor play and heartily wishing himself back at the rand if it had not been for mary's sake he would have gone there and left the missing links in the chain to fate or providence but he loved mary and he knew that she loved him and was waiting for him and loyalty to that unspoken contract kept him at home sometimes he had thoughts of running down to suffolk to see his mother but his mind was too much troubled for him to find happiness in such a meeting he knew that she would question him closely about himself and that he would find it difficult to answer her questions so he deferred the meeting and was content to write occasionally under cover to the faithful factotum and to receive long fond letters from the loving mother letters in which she thanked and blessed him for not going back to africa 
he saw faunce from time to time and faunce was as keen upon discovery as he had been in the beginning of things he had been in paris and he had been in vienna but declared that the result was not worth discussing when i have any facts worth putting before you mr weldover you shall have them in the meantime a little moving about does me good it enables me to shake off my putney sluggishness he was firm in his opinion that the question of lisa rayner's death could never be reopened in a court of law to any useful end no magistrate in london would accept such evidence as we can produce he said the case would be dismissed as soon as you had made your statement what witnesses have you the durfins who might be firm in their recognition of their lodger but who could prove nothing except that he was living opposite the house where mrs rayner was murdered and left almost immediately after the murder the gunmaker's assistant has failed to identify him i took him to a mechanics institute at the east end where greswold was one of the speakers a week before his marriage and the man saw him and heard him and could make nothing of him the goggles that hid his eyes and the bowler hat that hid his forehead would make a great difference you see not enough to deceive a man like me with a memory for faces and a habit of registering every feature but quite enough to baffle the casual observer well i suppose after all our patience and perseverance and lucky hits the evidence isn't worth much from the legal point of view but give me the moral certainty let me be able to say to the girl i love that man is the murderer and to demonstrate his guilt by evidence that i can make as clear to her as it is to me help me to do that and i shall be satisfied even if i never see him at the old bailey never hear st sepulchre's bell toll for him easter and whitsuntide were passed and arnold had heard no more from faunce who had taken various other investigations in hand and had spent a good deal of his time on continental journeys since the beginning of the year they will have me at my old work mr wildover whether i like it or not he told arnold who was strongly of opinion that faunce did like his old work and liked no other the year wore on greswold had been returned by his east end constituency unopposed his popularity in that particular district was so well known that nobody had cared to waste time and money in fighting him the fact that he was now a rich man and that long-needed institutions baths and wash-houses and a nursery were being built at his sole expense would have made opposition madness there was nothing to be done against him in this heyday of his fame every day he lived was an exemplification of the cynical adage nothing succeeds like success there would come a time no doubt when the wheel would turn and the rabble who were full of gratitude to-day would begin to carp and question to belittle everything he had done for them and to talk of all the things he had left undone he had been heard in the house very often before the end of the session and he had been active upon every question that involved the welfare of the masses he was among the ultra radicals the men who want to abolish almost everything that makes up old-fashioned people's idea of england and to create a new england without an established church or a house of peers or a great capitalist and possibly without a beer-shop along ten miles of dusty high road an over-educated and very uncomfortable england in which jack was to be not only as good but a great deal better than his master arnold heard of oliver greswold's popularity in yorkshire from wilmot armstrong who was pressing in his invitations to his old chum to go and stay at lingfield and do a little fishing or go to all the summer races within a day's journey by road or rail arnold wanted to be at lingfield later and he had his own plans with reference to that visit it was not till september that he received any communication of importance from faunce but early in that month a telegram summoned him to putney it was the briefest of messages news for you at home all afternoon arnold was in a hansom cab bowling along the embankment five minutes after the telegram was handed to him well said faunce who was sunburnt from foreign travel and looked as jovial as a man who has been doing nothing but amuse himself 
i think i have taken your business as far as it will go and that i have been about as much use to you or as little as i am likely to be you have been of the greatest use without you i could have done nothing it's very nice of you to say that i think i have made that poor young woman's identity as clear as it could be made having no better evidence of name than that little lutheran testament which helped me to find fraulein noack without her we might never have discovered the man called clissold that was not his real name i suppose no it was not his real name yet he had a kind of claim to it i found on looking up lodge that carford is the family name of lord felix stowe and that the last lord felix stowe married the only daughter and heiress of john clissold of the towers wavertree liverpool there is a famous firm of shipbuilders at liverpool called clissold and i dare say this clissold was a member of that firm there you see you have the names of carford and clissold in close association now the late lord felixstowe was well known on the turf and known as a shady customer whose stable was suspected of in and out running and whose horses were only backed by the greenhorns a little cautious stimulation of old ludgater's memory produced the fact that lord felixstowe was one of his late master's most important clients tin deed-boxes with his name were still in the loft at the belvedere when ludgater left mr gresshold's service oh ludgater has left him then yes he has retired with a liberal pension and has nothing but good to say of his master's heir who might have thrown him upon the union as there was no provision made for him in the old man's will there never was such a cruel will ludgater said for if ever a servant had a right to be provided for he ludgater had that right and his master of forty years had not left him forty shillings i think he would have liked us all to rot said ludgater i believe he felt so savage at not being able to take his money with him that he left it so as to give everybody as much trouble and vexation as possible or else he would hardly have given the granddaughter he never saw preference over the grandson who had lived with him and knuckled under to him all his life i didn't think it worth while to suggest that this inconsistency was only one of the numerous inconsistencies that make the sum of human nature if i were describing the average man by figures mr wildover the total to be a hundred i should reckon generosity fifteen justice five honesty five acquisitiveness envy and jealousy thirty inconsistency forty-five that is my experience of the human race and that is why no man's conduct can be calculated beforehand here you have the least likely will for an offended father to make here you have the least likely man to be a murderer but i am rambling away from our business faunce went on with his story and did not again diverge into any expression of his own opinions ludgater having been put on the right scent by the mention of lord felixstowe presently unassisted by any further suggestion recalled the name of carford the young man who had come on several occasions to the belvedere at first as a client of andrew greswold and later as a surreptitious visitor to the young lady was the hon ralph carford lord felixstowe's second son he lived most of his time near epsom with his lordship's trainer and was well known as a gentleman jock having ridden his father's horses in the crack steeplechases as well as in a great many smaller races such as windsor yes carford was the man a handsome attractive-looking man always well dressed in a sporting style age at the time of the elopement about thirty the young lady was under twenty-one armed with this knowledge it had been an easy matter for faunce to trace the marriage of these two before the clapham registrar and further to find their whereabouts in paris where they occupied a fourth floor in the faubourg saint honore and where the record of mr carford's habits was still existent in the memory of an old woman who had been portress and bonne à tout faire in the house and who now sold newspapers in a kiosk on the boulevard saint michel 
from this old woman hunted down after considerable trouble faunce had heard not only the habits of mr carford his frequent absences across the channel his riding in steeplechases at dieppe and in brittany his variable fortunes and variable tempers his reckless money-spending late hours and occasional drunkenness but he also heard that all this information had been given two years ago to an englishman who spoke french like a native and who had taken great trouble to discover the ci devant portress this had been faunce's first knowledge of the french-speaking englishman whom he heard of after this at every halting-place on ralph carford's road to ruin wherever he found the trace of carford under this or that change of name he also found that the same inquirer had been there before him and after hearing this inquiring spirit described by a great many different people more or less minutely he had not the shadow of doubt as to the man's identity he must be stephen bardhurst and no other this bardhurst was a private detective who had begun life as a gentleman an amateur actor who had then gone on the stage and acted at london theatres for three or four seasons with some success in certain character parts but with a lack of voice and presence which barred his achieving a permanent position on the boards he had then taken to the delicate investigation business and had done well in it exacting swinging terms from jealous wives and husbands who wanted to cut the matrimonial knot with the abhorred shears of the divorce court his experience as a character actor made him good at disguises while his education and antecedents had enabled him to hold his own where the average scotland yard detective would have shown the cloven foot of the policeman in the gentleman's dress boot in following up carford from city to city from affluent dissipation to penury and ruin mr bardhurst had not considered disguise necessary his own close-cropped scanty head and crooked nose had been good enough for the job and these with the freckled complexion narrow shoulders and slight stoop were enough to denote the man he had traced various stages in the well-born adventurer's career and faunts had followed there being always at each stage some indication that led to the next although in some cases the scent was so weak as to require much patience and energy on the part of the sleuth hound step by step the miserable lives were traced the daughter's birth in paris the return to london during her infancy then back to paris then after three years to havre whence carford sailed for new york and where the wife and child lived in decent poverty during his two years absence and where the wife died and was buried shortly before his return then the departure of the father with his seven-year-old child for germany and then after a dissipated and disreputable career at frankfurt hamburg and berlin the final remove to vienna where he called himself clissold and where he sank to the lowest depth of sordid debauchery drunkard gambler cheat his miserable death unnoticed save by the police authorities who recorded it as one of the tragic entries in their calendar of vice and crime faunce had discovered that during all these years ralph carford had been drawing an income of a little less than two hundred a year chargeable upon his father's estate and paid half yearly through the family solicitor and it was partly by these payments through local bankers that faunce and the sandy-haired bardhurst before him had been able to follow the reprobate's career there was no link missing in the history of julia greswold's husband and no shadow of doubt that the hapless woman known to charlotte nowak as lisa glissold and to arnold wentworth as lisa rayner was lillian carford granddaughter and heiress had she survived him of andrew greswold you made no discovery as to the man who took lisa away from that wretched home in the vienna lodging-house arnold asked hesitatingly no there are too many men of that class in vienna the search would have been endless and it matters so little after all the story you heard from the servant proves how bitterly that poor girl suffered before she took the fatal step 
what excuses she might have made for herself when she told me the story of her fall and she made none she humbled herself in the dust she thought herself the worst of sinners oh what a life it was faunce and what a death the sinner who was responsible for the life has gone to his account the sinner who has to answer for the death shall be my business you don't suppose you can bring him to the gallows to the old bailey even upon such evidence as this there is no link wanting we have the motive we know that the man was there on the night of the murder within a few yards of his victim yes we know he was there or we think we do but that's not the same thing as making a jury know it or getting a police magistrate to believe that oliver greswold the working man's friend and advocate is a murderer the woman was murdered and he was a gainer by her death but we have no evidence that he murdered her suppose the durfins are firm in their recognition of him as their mysterious lodger what does that prove he would give some plausible excuse for his assumed name some plausible account of his business in that part of the town and his character would in itself seem a sufficient refutation of such a charge unless backed by overwhelming evidence the sergeant who saw him following his victim no evidence that the woman the sergeant saw was lisa rayner or that the man was oliver greswold we have a strong series of probabilities a chain of conjectures but we have no case for a magistrate least of all for a jury in my own mind i have now very little doubt that greswold killed her he and morris mortimer are close allies and mortimer may have told him the contents of his grandfather's will and so set him upon his plan first to trace his cousin and then to get rid of her perhaps to a man of that kind it would seem hardly a crime to make an end of such a life as hers he may have thought her life less innocent than it was you see and that he the saint had a superior right to the fortune well he may escape the law of the land interrupted arnold impetuously but he shall not escape me after all what would it profit her at rest under the rose-trees at highgate that this man should die by the hangman's hand and what does it matter to me personally what the world at large thinks of lisa rayner's murderer when there are only about three people yourself chilbrick and one other who know me as the man from south africa locked up for a month under suspicion but i want that one other to know that oliver greswold was the murderer and not i and she shall know it how from his own confession to whom he might confess to the chaplain at newgate in the condemned cell but as you will never get him there his confession to me faunce to me the man who has suffered for his crime his deliberate statement over his own signature given in the presence of the woman who is to be my wife or so given that she cannot doubt it you think you can bring him to that think i say i mean to do it i shall live for nothing else it is only a question of life and time his life and mine one of us may die before it is done but if we both live by god's grace it shall be done end of chapter eighteen what he meant to do chapter nineteen of rough justice this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell Rough Justice by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Chapter 19 The American Remembers This life has nothing more exquisite than the first year of a love match, a marriage of minds and hearts, a union upon which heaven and friends and fortune smile at morning and night upon her knees lady violet greswold offered up her gratitude to the creator who had given her so happy a lot there was no cloud on her horizon no fear in her heart that life would ever be less perfect save that one fear of sickness and of death 
which lies always at the bottom of all human bliss the knowledge that in a day in an hour the light may change to darkness happily in the glow of youth and health in a busy life full of duties to be done the haunting shadow of man's common doom came but seldom across her path sickness old age and death seemed very far off especially to one whose parish visiting had brought her for the most part in contact with extreme old age it seemed to her indeed that among those hardy yorkshire peasants it was more difficult to die than to live they suffered diseases that would have killed hercules and held fast by life for years after any london physician would have condemned a london patient seeing such powers of resistance in the life she knew it was but natural that she should think of her husband as if he were immortal indeed there were times when she seemed so to think of him weaving her bright dreams of his future ambitious only for him proud only of him his success in the house of commons enchanted her to her he was a heaven-born debater the wrongs of all the ages would be righted now that he was in his proper place to fight the cause of the lowly born and the oppressed the hewers of wood and drawers of water the little children toiling in mills and factories or in the darkness underground as her father had fought for them when he was a young man in the house of commons many wrongs had been righted much had been gained on the side of enlightenment since lord hilliard had come from oxford to cast in his lot with reformers and peace lovers but much still remained to be done and the people were asking for much more now than they would have thought of claiming when her father was young the views of the proletariat as to their own rights had widened considerably since lord hilliard began his great fight for the working man lady violet and her husband lived at hyde park gardens during oliver's first session and the young wife's fair face and tall slim figure were often to be seen at tea-time on the house of commons terrace where she loved to sit with her husband hearing the prospects of the evening's debate at a little table apart from those gayer groups assembled for pleasure only their talk was serious and she felt as if the happiness of a people depended on the speech of the husband she loved to her he was not a unit in the house he was the house itself or all that was worthy to be considered there greswold insisted that she should read the whole of a debate in which he took part and tried to make her see the merits of other speakers on his side even if she could admit no merits in his opponents but to her mind the speeches of other members were only the quartz out of which the gold of his eloquence was extracted and now when the session was over and all the smart people were scattering themselves over the continent of europe greswold and his wife were living quietly at wilverwald house where he was resting after a really laborious session in which he had worked with all the unmeasured energy of a man to whom parliamentary life is still new the time when he would learn to spare himself to hold his power in reserve for great occasions had not yet come nor had he spared himself outside the house any more than inside he had spoken at all the old places the mechanics halls and free libraries and provident institutes and polytechnics at which he had been accustomed to speak he had superintended the beginning of philanthropic schemes which his wealth was to establish he had worked with unremitting energy and the result was that he came to wilverwald looking fagged and as an american friend who was on a visit to him put it very much under the weather a week in our moorland air will cure him violet said and she made it the business of her life that he should have rest and recreation she sent him out upon fishing expeditions with mr somerville his friend from new york a man who had been doing in the worst slums of that city very much the same kind of work that greswold had been doing in east london she organized picnic luncheons and long excursions she contrived a life under the open sky determined to keep her husband away from those blue books to which so much of his existence had been given and this out-of-door life she could share with him her country habits had made her a good walker and twelve or fifteen miles seemed no more to her than a walk across hyde park for her bayswater neighbours 
wilmot and ida were established at lingfield and shared in many of these excursions every ruin and every waterfall serving as an excuse for a ten-mile drive and an out-of-door meal violet quoted in memoriam and compared their talk with the discourse of those bright incomparable spirits who love to banquet in the distant woods and who glanced from theme to theme discussed the books to love or hate or touched the changes of the state or threaded some socratic dream while the wine flask cooled under dusky waters and the simple meal was spread upon heather scented sward there was talk enough at these rustic meals albeit the talkers were inferior spirits to arthur hallam and alfred tennyson there were youth and energy ambition and the love of books worthy to be loved violet thought her husband equal to any man who had lived before him he was not a poet but his life was full of aspiration and schemes that he who wrote maud would have honoured would have woven into immortal verse perhaps had he heard the philanthropist expound his far-reaching views and paint the fairer future of regenerate mankind poverty that should be no longer sordid or loathly spoilers who should be no longer dwellers in the dark of ignorance and neglect a world whose blessings should be shared as fairly as angels and seraphs share the bliss of heaven the most vehement and not the least interesting in the little band of talkers was lawrence somerville mr greswold's american guest whose friendship seemed none the less cordial because it was a thing of recent growth somerville was greswold's senior by only a few years and had been attracted to him by his reputation as lord hilliard's lieutenant the american had inherited a large fortune and had devoted a considerable portion of his time and wealth to schemes for the public good and had therefore a peculiar interest in such work as lord hilliard was doing together with a subtle conviction that nothing done in england could be done as intelligently or as effectually as what he and others were doing in new york i thought i should like to see if there were any strong points in your work he told oliver frankly of course i knew i should find plenty of mistakes i was keener in getting at your ideas than at his lordship's he belongs to a played-out generation wilberforce and his lot thought they were doing a good deal when they emancipated the colored man they haven't seen the last of him yet by the way and started a ragged school or two and even now you think that a night refuge where your pauper population can be dirty and uncomfortable under cover is the way to salvation we've gone you several better than that we don't think we're doing a heap when we feed one in ten and leave the other nine to starve we've got to look after everybody if we can find the hang of it and we mean to find it sooner or later and then he looked round smiling at the little circle as if he had been saying the politest thing possible he had heard oliver speak a good many times in london and the suburbs and had condescended to no word of praise which reticence would have made violet dislike him had there not been a pleasantness in the man's voice and face and a magnetism in the man's manner which compelled every woman's liking but while she was thinking him a goth in this matter of non-appreciation he startled her one day by saying i've heard your husband more than once well ma'am he can speak he's what we call a speaker there aren't many of em and when i hear a speaker i know it he was born that way late in september the little circle was increased by the arrival of mary freeland at lingfeld delighted at the prospect of a long holiday from the conventionalities of south kensington you needn't even wear gloves here unless you like the sensation ida told her i never wear mine except for church and visiting i am always doing something with flowers or ferns or dogs something that makes gloves a nuisance of course i have gardening gloves but they are generally in my pocket you have no idea how delicious life is here after a long course of russell square the moorland air makes me feel drunk and i go dancing along over the heather like a lunatic if my poor mother would only come here a dreadful thing would happen to her she would get well dreadful ida dreadful for her poor dear 
she has been ill for years don't you know her illness is her only occupation the only interest she has in life what would become of her if she began to feel thoroughly well to have no excuse for listening to herself as the french call it it would be too cruel mother so enjoys her privileges as a confirmed invalid mary was delighted with lingfield the solitude the wide horizon the heathery waste gemmed here and there with a dark tarn that flashed in the sunlight the marshy hollows above which the peewits screamed and soared as she and her friends rode by they had found her a horse that would have carried her all over the three ridings wilmot assured her without being sick or sorry and who was all the better for doing twenty miles a day so when wilmot was shooting and didn't want feminine company the two girls rode over the moors or in the grass lanes at their own sweet will or went to wilverwold and spent a long afternoon in the garden with violet and sometimes with violet's husband who would sit and brood over a book or lie in a hammock seemingly asleep while the young women dawdled through a game of croquet or indulged in the mild diversion of garden golf or sauntered about the gardens mary remembered her last holiday with mrs smith a holiday in which prunes and prism had ever been the first consideration a holiday which had carried to country lanes and woods the gloves and fichus and narrow rules and social shams of hexton gardens in yorkshire she had felt more alive than she had ever felt since she left the saxon she felt her youth in her veins as she had felt it in south africa i believe you are bohemians at heart both of you she told ida and her husband i am as much at my ease with you as with my dear old uncle and aunt at johannesburg i suppose it comes from your having lived at the rand mr armstrong south africa is my idea of a liberal education but ida is a thorough bohemian look at her sunburnt hands and she has never seen the orange free state ida is like you as the husband is the wife is well i'm glad you like african rovers miss freeland for i expect one of them in a day or two and i hope you and ida will make him happy here mary blushed crimson with a sudden overpowering gladness is it mr wentworth yes it is wentworth he and i are like brothers you know he is not so light-hearted as he used to be but i think you can make him forget his troubles i wish i could said mary frankly i don't know why he should have any troubles said ida or why he should hold himself aloof from someone he dearly loves for i know he does love you molly don't blush dear we have no secrets among us why should he trifle with happiness he has plenty of money and you have plenty why shouldn't you be married this year and settle somewhere near us there are always nice places coming into the market he is a fool not to know where his happiness lies if you talk like that ida i shall pack my box and go back to hexton gardens mr wentworth has never said a word about marrying me nothing is further from his thoughts or from mine she had to rise from the garden seat and hurry away to hide her tears after this protest too keenly remembering that bitter day in hexton gardens when he had come to her strong in the pride of integrity warm with love when she might have made him her own for life and when her egregious folly had lost him to have suspected him her noblest and dearest of a cruel murder she must have been demented she had allowed her poor weak brain to be made a receptacle for other people's suspicions and opinions people for whom she cared not a straw had told her that he her true love was a murderer and she had believed them there are men not a numerous class who can keep a friend's secret even from a wife wilmot was among that faithful band ida knew nothing of the dark episode in the life of wentworth alias wildover and knew not the alias for there had been no letter writing between the orange free state and russell square wilmot had gone to the cape a man on his trial if he proved worthy he might come back some years later and offer himself again as a suitor for miss borrowdale until he proved himself worthy she must hold no communication with him his sins had been only the sins of youth 
but they had seemed terrible in the sight of mr borrowdale and this draconian sentence had been pronounced against him arnold arrived next day he knew that his love was at lingfeld and in spite of his recent avoidance of her he had his reasons for wishing her to be near at hand during his visit he had even asked wilmot to get her invited there but they met as they had always met of late as if they were on the most distant footing a friendship so cold as to seem little more than a casual acquaintance he was looking thin and careworn and more given to intervals of deep thought than a man who had come to shoot and fish and enjoy life at his friend's house ought to have been he was absent-minded and had to be spoken to three or four times on occasions before he could be roused to answer some trivial question about a gun or a dog whether he would go with the shooters or ride or drive with ida and mary he was curiously indifferent except when there was a question of joining the wilverwold party and then he was always eager mary's heart sank with a sickening fear sometimes had he fallen in love with lady violet no there could not be such a tragedy she was a jealous fool to imagine such a thing you seem to have taken a great liking to greswold wilmot said and yet i shouldn't have thought him the kind of man you would like one may be interested in a man without any ardent liking this man interests me well he is a man of strong character no doubt but i didn't know you were a student of human nature a new faculty with me perhaps developed by long idleness one had no time to study human nature on the rand one only wanted to feel sure it had a knife in its hand or a revolver at one's ear i am interested in greswold and in his american friend his american friend is interested in you i saw him studying your face at lunch yesterday did you another student of human nature i suppose greswold and somerville were to meet wilmot and his guest that morning the wilverwold shootings included a part of the moor behind lingfield and extended over a wide expanse of barren country there was a keeper's lodge in the midst of this barrenness which had been untenanted for years no keeper caring to live in a spot remote from civilization and esteemed unhealthy while there were cottages to be had nearer wilverwold village the deserted hovel was in a picturesque spot looking over the wastes of heather and gorse and the distant darkness of fir woods lady violet had known the lodge all her life and was pleased at being able to do what she liked with it under her orders it was made wind and weather tight lined with blue-gray tapestry furnished with bamboo chairs and tables and provided with a stove that would cook a luncheon and boil water for tea this was now the chosen resort of the shooters when sharp set after a long morning's tramp and a favorite rendezvous for afternoon tea when the home garden was renounced on account of the colder weather from wilverwold house to the shooters lodge was a three-mile walk greswold and his friends had spent the morning on the moors and had parted company at the lodge after lunch wilmot and arnold intending to walk back to lingfield while greswold drove his american guest home to wilverwold in his dog-cart both men were thoughtful and the rough track between the lodge and the high road made careful driving necessary and was an excuse for silence on the driver's part somerville was the first to speak i don't fancy you've had much of a time to-day he said what makes you think so well you looked bored i don't believe you care a lot for shooting i don't i was not bred up as a sportsman i shoot because open-air exercise is good for me and because it pleases my wife to see me tramping about the moor but i miss a bird as often as i hit one and what's more i don't care whether i hit or miss my heart isn't in it no more is that man wentworth though he's no slouch of a shot i don't think he is here for the shooting what then he is here to get rid of his life perhaps half of the people in the world have no stronger motive he ain't here for the girl eh miss freeland a pretty piece of commonplace the queen could call out regiments of such girls if they were wanted 
he ain't here for the girl. I don't like that man's way, Griswold. There's something back of it. I don't think he's the kind of man who ought to be admitted into a man's home. Your neighbor Armstrong seems a real good sort, and I don't like to see him making a friend of that man. Oh, Armstrong knows all about him, the best and the worst. They were chums in South Africa, a kind of adopted brothers, digging for diamonds or gold. I forget which. A gold digger in South Africa, was he? exclaimed Somerville eagerly. Then my memory for faces didn't play me any tricks, in spite of the whiskers. What do you mean? He is the man I thought. I remembered him, though when I saw him nearly two years ago he had whiskers that covered up his chin. I was puzzled the first time we were out with him. Where did I see that fellow? Where? When? Why is his face so familiar to me? The forehead and eyes, the way the hair grows at the temples, like the portraits of Henri Quatre. I kept asking myself questions all the time we were with him. I am a man who gets worried about that kind of thing. Where, when did I see him? Why did his face make such an impression upon me? He must have interested me more than the common herd, or I shouldn't have such a distinct idea of him. Today, as we were sitting at lunch, the place, the atmosphere, the hour of our last meeting came upon me in a flash, and I was there again, in the foggy London police court lamps burning in your British daylight, candles on the magistrate's desk, and that man standing in the dock on suspicion of murder, the man from South Africa. The hands on the reins made a movement that startled the light-mouthed horse, and he broke from a trot into a tempestuous canter. "'What's the matter?' cried Somerville. "'A rabbit, perhaps. The beast shies at a feather. Well, I think you are mistaken, Somerville. A chance likeness, and the fact that this man has been at the Cape, have misled you. I saw the likeness before you said he had been at the Cape. I tell you, I know the man now as surely as if I had known him all my life. What was the murder? A poor creature, a woman living alone in a London lodging. A man followed her to her miserable attic and blew out her brains in a house full of people, at one o'clock on Christmas morning. He hadn't much of your British reverence for Christmas, you see. He had got away beyond that. And you say that Armstrong's friend Wentworth was in the dock at Bow Street. I didn't say Bow Street, but I believe it was Bow Street. You remember the murder, I dare say. It made a good deal of talk at the time. Yes, I remember something about it and that a man was arrested on suspicion who had recently returned from the Cape. The evidence broke down and he was discharged, but that does not prevent his being guilty. And you say that this Wentworth is that very man? I would swear to it in any court of law, if his life or mine depended upon my accuracy. Curious. How did you happen to be present? I was there for a purpose to see what an inquiry before the magistrate upon a serious charge was like. I had been at the Old Bailey and in most of your great law courts, and I wanted to see how the preliminary inquiry worked. And then I was interested in the murder as a murder, and I reckoned I'd like to see the possible murderer. Did he impress you as an innocent man? No. He looked haggard, angry, desperate, a wild beast at bay, full of savage impulses, yet not without remorse. I made a study of his face, and I could see the agony of his soul when the woman was spoken of, her aspect after the murder, all the hideousness and horror of it. He had killed her upon some sudden brutal impulse, I believe, wanting to get rid of a woman who had some strong claim upon him, and who was importunate and not to be shaken off. He had given her money, you see, and that had not satisfied her. She was hanging upon him, crying and worrying the very soul of him. Upon my honor, Greswold, if you consider the worrying power of a woman, it's a wonder more of them don't get themselves murdered. Then you think he was guilty? Who can doubt it? The man was there within five minutes of her death. They were seen together. She was in tears, and there was trouble between them. What more probable than that she would admit him to the house, her friend whom she trusted. What more unlikely 
that she would admit a stranger or that any stranger would have been quick enough and daring enough to slip in at the half-open street door while she and her friend stood talking by the railings murderers are not conjurers the police failed in making a clear case against the man and then no doubt they fell back upon their usual theory in london or new york paris or berlin they are pretty much the same the theory of the unknown assassin who is cuter than all the rest of creation you may be mistaken in the man after all there are accidental likenesses strong enough to deceive a court of justice yes lazerks and dubosques for instance i guess you were going to quote that case i tell you greswold i am sure of my fact and i don't like to see a decent fellow like armstrong and two nice young women like his wife and miss freeland living on friendly terms with a murderer come you have no right to condemn a man whom a magistrate refused to commit armstrong may know all about the case and his friend may stand acquitted in his judgment his friend is very artful a statement he made at holloway while he was on remand was read in court he made a plausible story which sounded like truth and no doubt was truth as far as it went leaving out the murder if armstrong knows that he was the suspected murderer of that unhappy young woman i don't recall her name he has no right to admit him to his house to bring him into friendly relations with an innocent girl like miss freeland i begin to think you have fallen in love with miss freeland no i haven't i'm past the age when a man falls in love but i know a nice girl when i meet one a frank truthful whole-souled girl the sort of girl who makes a good wife not a walking advertisement for a dry goods store yes i admire mary freeland you've got a pearl beyond all price for your own share greswold but i hope you don't think you're the only man in the world entitled to a good wife indeed i do not and if you can win mary freeland you shall have my blessing thank you no i don't see my way to that i'm too old and what's worse she is too much taken up with that fellow i just reckon i shall have to give her a pointer about him what tell her your suspicions tell her that he is the man i saw in the dock not once but three times i watched the case all through you had better not remember the english law of libel and that the truth may be libel i'm not afraid of your law if you don't want to win her for your wife you had better leave her affections to take care of themselves besides if she likes this man nothing you could say would set her against him she will accept the fact of his not being committed for trial as proof positive of his innocence guess you're right there an innocent girl over head and ears in love with a bad man is a difficult kind of beast to herd up i'd as soon take a rhinoceros by the horn and try to turn him from the way he's made up his mind to go believe me you had better not interfere in this case and above all not a word to my wife if you say not of course i shan't give him away but i hope you'll let lady violet know what sort of angel she has been entertaining unawares they had passed the lodge and were driving up the avenue violet appeared in the portico as they approached and welcomed their return with a smile which changed to an anxious expression at a nearer view of her husband's face seldom had she seen that pallid grayish colouring or that drawn look about his mouth she made no remark but he saw her change of countenance and hastened to reassure her there's nothing amiss vio i'm only fagged after a long morning on the moors i'll go to my den and rest i'll bring you some tea dear at once and read you to sleep if you'll let me it was one of her most valued privileges to read to him in his intervals of rest after exhausting mental work his acquaintance with light literature with the poets novelists essayists of the past and present had been gained for the most part since his marriage for all his own reading had been of a heavier order consisting chiefly of blue books and their like the history of human wrong and suffering and the work that had been done or attempted by the strong on behalf of the weak no dear i couldn't stand being read to this afternoon i just want to lie down and make myself a mindless log for the next two or three hours 
and I shall join you and your party before dinner as fresh as a daisy. I think the Lingfield people are to dine with us tonight, and the vicar. Yes, they are coming, and my father is coming to meet them, but I can send a messenger and put them all off. They can come any other day. Don't let us have them if you are ill. Don't you think we ought to put them off, Mr. Somerville? He was looking pretty bad as we drove home, but I don't suppose it was anything more than the effect of a plaguy long walk. You English are never satisfied till you're tired to death. I won't have any one put off. I shall be fresh enough for a dinner party of forty when I have slept off my fatigue, Greswold said decisively. His den, a large panelled parlour, was at the end of the house furthest from hall and staircase, and from all the movement of servants and visitors. Here, when he shut the door upon himself, he shut out all sounds, save the faraway cawing of rooks in the park. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Rough Justice This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell. Rough Justice by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter 20. The Man Behind the Mask. There was an old Vauxhall looking-glass over the chimney-piece, framed in the oak panelling. Oliver Greswold walked across the room, and looked at his haggard face reflected unflatteringly in the tarnished old glass. "'White-livered idiot,' he muttered, "'to be so feeble, just when pluck and force were most needed. A man of decent physique wouldn't have turned a hair. But that's where my cockney training comes in. Poor blood, and not enough of that. Pluck, force, endurance. What do they mean? Red corpuscles. Perfect physical health. The mind is only the flame. The body is the oil. And the oil in my lamp has been running low ever since the one bold act of my life. He had locked the door, was secure of not being disturbed in his solitude but he was in no humour for that supreme repose of which he had talked, to lie like a log steeped in dreamless sleep. On the contrary, every feature in his clear-cut face was sharpened by intense thought. He walked up and down the room, where there had been ample space left on purpose for such perambulations, essential to him at all times and seasons in the brief intervals of his work. Everything in this room had been chosen and arranged with a view to his pleasure and comfort, from the large knee-hole desk in front of the fireplace, old Spanish mahogany, beeswaxed into brightness, to the thick turkey carpet in rich blues and yellows that covered the floor and made his perambulations noiseless. The only books in this room were the books he wanted for reference, and these filled two substantial revolving bookcases, one on each side of his desk. A large sofa by the fireplace afforded the opportunity for such rest as he had talked of this afternoon. Lady Violet had heaped one end of it with silken pillows, and this was the only feminine note in the room. The three deep-set windows looked into a small enclosed garden which had once been the physic garden of the housemistress, in the days when every country gentleman's wife was learned in herbs and simples, and grew enough rosemary and rue peppermint and lavender, to make medicine for the whole of her parish. A hedge of clipped yew shut this garden from the outer world, and intensified the quiet of the room by the narrowness of the outlook. Greswold could see nothing above the eight-foot hedge nearer than the treetops in his park, but the little garden was laid out in geometrical beds full of flowers people love best. Carnations, mignonette, stocks, pansies, heliotrope, and in the middle of every bed a standard rose. A pleasant garden on which to look out with folded arms on the cushioned window ledge, to look out upon in idle mood, with musings attuned to the lazy drone of the bees. A pleasant prospect for any man whose mind had room for pleasant thoughts, but not for Oliver Greswold. Oh, full of scorpions is my mind, dear wife. 
Greswold's mind was full of scorpions. Today, for the first time, he had discovered that he was not the strong man he thought himself, that the iron nerves of which he had been so proud were not all iron, since at the first hint of peril his courage failed him, or his nerves gave way. It came to the same thing. I am not a coward, he thought, but I could not keep the blood in my face today when I heard Somerville's assertion. If he is right, if this Wentworth is wild over, can I doubt that he has a purpose in being here, in cultivating my acquaintance? Fool! I thought he was an ignorant admirer, a dull, well-meaning fellow who took an interest in my work. I looked down at him from the height of a superior intellect, was no more troubled by his existence than if he had been a harmless, friendly dog, somebody else's dog, that fawned upon me. He stopped in his monotonous pacing between the windows and the wall, and laid two fingers on his wrist. The pulse was thin and fluttering, the pulse of a man who had let his strength run down, and whose nerves had suffered in consequence. He remembered himself two years ago, a man of iron, indefatigable, alert, prepared for every emergency. Since that time he had been too eager, had used and wasted his energies without thought of the future. Sleepless nights had been the only respite from days crowded with engagements. He had risen unrefreshed and had fought against exhaustion. In those pacings to and fro his mind travelled over all the pages of his life history. If the book could have been begun again, would he have made it different? He hardly knew. His life history, as the world knew it, was simple enough. A boyhood passed under the gloomiest conditions, a son left fatherless and dependent on a vain, weak-brained mother, who had caught at the first offer of a second husband, married a country vicar, and was very glad to renounce all claim to her son, and to be exonerated from all care and affection for him in the future. He remembered her tearless eyes when she left him in his grandfather's dismal house, her indifference as to the chances of their future meeting. She had harped upon his advantages in the transfer, his grandfather's wealth, which he would no doubt inherit. He never saw her again. She died three years after her second marriage, leaving an infant daughter who did not long survive her. At fourteen years of age Oliver was motherless, and knew that he had no one to look to but the grim old man who sat at meat with him day after day, and hardly ever flung him a civil word. The boy ate his dinner in silence, while his grandfather's spasmodic scraps of conversation were with the confidential servant who waited upon them, and not with the clever nephew, whose observant eyes watched those two withered faces, and wondered if there were many such men in the world, and many fortunes that brought so little pleasure and comfort to their possessor as his grandfather's wealth afforded him. Ill-dressed, ill-fed, ill-housed, for the neglected rooms at the Belvedere were cold and draughty, shabby, cheerless, unbeautiful. Oliver thought with angry contempt of the money piled up at compound interest year after year. Already he had begun to brood upon the problem which the unequal distribution of happiness presents to every ardent mind, and already he had learnt to pity the poor. He was a day-boy at one of the city schools, and his grandfather's generosity went so far as to allow him the bare cost of the omnibus journey between Clapham Common and the Mansion House, with the addition of a shilling per diem for his lunch. He saved on omnibus and on lunch, and bought books, or on occasion gave the money in charity. And in the leisure allowed by lunching on a bun or a sandwich, instead of sitting down to a substantial meal, he amused himself by exploring the slums within a mile of his school. Little by little in this manner he made himself familiar with queer neighborhoods and queer people, and on more than one occasion was shocked at finding that some of the most miserable lodging houses in East London were owned by his grandfather. He had heard master and servant talking of these houses, and had gone to look at them. Soon after this he heard Lord Hilliard speak at a meeting in South London, and dim visions of the good that a wealthy philanthropist might do 
began to fill his brain. He had read books written by socialists, and he had already taken sides against the idle rich, the class he had seen in Hyde Park riding or driving in the summer sunset, while the crowd looked on as at the pleasures of a privileged race, human butterflies flitting to and fro amidst the roses of life. Having only the London streets for his recreation, he had explored the West End as well as the East, and ever present in his thoughts of rich and poor was the contrast between the lamp-lit dining-room in Park Lane, the women with diamonds in their hair, the table covered with flowers, the powdered heads and solemn faces of the footmen serving wine, as if it were a libation to the god of luxury, and a ground-floor room he had seen at the same peaceful evening hour through an open window in Whitechapel, mother and father and children at their wretched supper, an idiot gibbering in his corner, tied into a broken armchair, and in another corner a childish form lying stiff and stark under a ragged coverlet, with a few sprigs of rosemary scattered about it. He thought of his grandfather's hoards, and of the good that heaped-up gold might do by and by, when it should be at his disposal. He had no doubt in his mind at this time. His grandfather had adopted him, and meant to make him his heir. Whenever the old man talked to him, it was of the wise uses of money, how to make it grow and multiply, how to invest wisely and well, when to be bold, when to be cautious. I have never made an unlucky investment, he would say in conclusion, satisfied that he had fulfilled the whole duty of man. Morning and evening prayer, the Psalms of David, the splendid imagery of Isaiah, read by the miser's pinched lips in a quavering monotone, did not make Oliver in love with religion any more than the long sittings in an ugly church and the cold Sunday meals. The thing he most loathed in all his unlovely life was the too soon recurrent Sunday. That seventh day, to which many people look forward as a day of rest, was to him an interval of absolute suffering. And he promised himself that if he ever realized his boyish ambition and won a seat in Parliament, his chief and most ardent efforts would be directed to the abolition of all sabbatical restraints. Let the fools crowd their churches and sit in a fusty atmosphere, listening to truism and commonplace, spread thin over a choir of sermon paper. But let the sensible majority take their pleasures unimpeded by legislation, unfettered by the tyranny of custom. But in the meantime, always mindful of the fact that his grandfather held the golden key to his future happiness, he was careful not to offend by so much as a hint at his real opinions. He was punctual at every pious observance. He listened attentively to the weekly morning and evening sermon, and he was always ready to discuss the last pious discourse, either with his grandfather or with the nonconformist divine who sometimes joined them at the supper-table, and for whose entertainment a bottle of the wine of other days was brought in from the dusty limbo below stairs where the spirits of mirth and good company slumbered in deep stone bins muffled in sawdust and wreathed in the cobwebs of years. There were very few visitors at the Belvedere, but those few were always polite and friendly to the solitary boy, and before he was in his teens Oliver had summed up these courtesies as rendered to the future millionaire. Old Morris Mortimer, the solicitor, used to pat him on the head while he was small, and had tipped him with the only half-sovereigns his childish fingers had ever grasped. When he was taller, the tips became sovereigns, and the pat on the head changed to a slap on the shoulder. "'You are a good, industrious boy,' said old Morris Mortimer, when the lad had brought home a batch of prizes, Milton, Pope, Macaulay, in the gaudy prize-binding of crimson and gold." and your grandfather will get proud of you by and by, if you do as well at the university as you are doing in school. "'Will my grandfather send me to the varsity?' Oliver asked eagerly. "'Yes, if you get a scholarship.' "'They say I am sure of a scholarship.' 
Go in and win, then. I suppose you'll be choosing a profession before long. I should like to go to the bar, if my grandfather would let me. Your grandfather is an old man, Nall, and I dare say you'll be able to do pretty much what you like by the time you're five and twenty. Later, when Oliver had left Cambridge after having made his mark there, it seemed to him as if the very fact of his success was unpleasant to the old man, who would harp upon his own lack of education, his squalid childhood, his impecunious youth, and would sneer at those academical distinctions which so often marked the bright beginning of a life that ended in failure. Oliver fancied that in that warped mind there lurked a rancorous dislike of youth that had begun to realize its ambitions and had a long life before it in which to conquer and enjoy. What was there in front of this miserable old man when the lean fingers that trembled over piles of dirty silver had lost their sense of touch, and the sunken eyes which brightened only at the idea of gain were too dim to see the figures in his bank book? For him there remained only nothingness and the dark. For the man of twenty, who had lived hitherto only to acquire the knowledge that is power, for him there opened the long vista of prosperous years. Intellectual power used for good, ambitions realized, fortune and fame hand in hand. Oliver Greswold's college career had brought him in contact with various classes of men, and he had made for himself this discovery, that there is no surer or swifter road to distinction than philanthropy. Having discovered this, he determined that the business of his life should be the betterment of his oppressed and unhappy fellow creatures. He was not a mere calculating machine, with self as the sole motive power. He had charitable instincts, the gift of pity, or at least a sensitiveness about suffering that moved him to help the sufferer. His joyless boyhood, his stinted youth, had taught him to hate the rich and to sympathize with the poor. He saw undergraduates flinging their money about, wallowing in expensive sports and sensual indulgences, and he remembered the young men he had seen in the slums, the hollow-eyed students at the free library, the lads paying pitch and toss in a dirty alley, to jump up and scamper off like scared rabbits at sight of a policeman turning the corner. A keen sense of the inequalities of life inspired him with a very real yearning to do some good in his generation, to win happiness for others while he was winning distinction for himself. The poor and ill-used were to be the ladder by which he scaled ambitious heights, but those who made the ladder should be the better for his ascent. He had been a hypocrite in his tacit acceptance of a creed that he despised. He had dismissed religion from his thoughts as a bugbear and a dream. But his humanity was real. He believed in man's duty to man. He believed in the capacity for better things latent in the lowest races. From the keen-witted product of poverty and vice cradled in London gutters to the man-eating savage of New Guinea. All of these were capable of regeneration not that regeneration which soothes their misery with visions of a happier world hereafter, but that transformation of creatures that have crawled and suffered in the black night of ignorance and pauperism to a race of men who dare to stand upright and face the sun and claim their portion in the comforts and joys of life. A world in which there should be no hidden misery starving in cellars and garrets, a world where all labor should be performed under the healthiest and happiest conditions which the capitalist thought and care should provide for the worker, where old age should go cheerily to the refuge the state provided, sure of kindly treatment, and where it would be only the few who would have need of such an asylum, since for the many it would be made easy for youth and middle age to set aside a provision state-aided, for the years of feebleness and gray hairs. So much had been done since Lord Hilliard began his life mission. In the mine, in the factory, in the private madhouse, that good man's influence had been a lamp to lighten the darkness. And yet so much more remained to be done.
the achievements of half a century seemed little to the dreamer of what might be had he lord hilliard's power to inaugurate schemes and draw upon well-filled purses but for him oliver greswold there would be no achievement while his grandfather lived he could but bide his time and make plans for the future and pace those gardens of st john's a solitary figure choosing the lonelier walks out of the way of men hurrying to the boats or playing tennis aloof from the loud-voiced empty-headed undergraduate it was at cambridge he first met lord hilliard who had come to see a favourite nephew and who spoke at a meeting of johnians bent upon establishing a mission after the example of their neighbours of trinity lord hilliard's manner earnest yet suave and of an antique courtesy charmed the young man who had come in contact with very few gentlemen the difference between the philanthropist and morris mortimer might be more subtly expressed but was wider than the difference between a coffer and an english peasant oliver got himself introduced to lord hilliard made a very favourable impression and was asked to luncheon in the nephew's rooms where his earnestness and genuine interest in the philanthropist's work was reciprocated by the interest of the older man in the enthusiasm of the younger out of that luncheon party and a conversation which lasted late into the afternoon arose a friendship which was sustained by devotion and usefulness on greswold's part within a few months after he left cambridge he had taken a definite rank in lord hilliard's house and he devoted the greater part of his life to lord hilliard's service an employment of his time which the old uncle at clapham appeared to approve though he was deaf to any appeal for money in aid of those benevolent schemes which he affected to admire lord hilliard was low church and this fact alone recommended him to mr greswold nor was the sous devant adviser of toffs by any means disposed to undervalue the advantages of friendship with a man of the philanthropist birth and station he approved but he did nothing to assist the alliance in hyde park gardens oliver greswold found himself in a new atmosphere the sweetness of the christian life among people of education and refinement came upon him as a delightful surprise and for the first time since he had begun to think he was sorry he was not a christian with regard to his worldly prospects the young man was perfectly frank he told lord hilliard all he could of his grandfather's circumstances and his own rearing i believe my grandfather to be a rich man and i believe he means to make me his heir no other relative has ever crossed his threshold since i can remember and i suppose that when he took me from my mother and charged himself with my bringing up he may be said to have adopted me of course he has adopted you and means you to inherit his fortune answered lord hilliard who was of a sanguine temper and always looked at the bright side of things you will have grand opportunities in the future greswold you will be a power for good when my working day is done lord hilliard had made inquiries about old greswold's career and the sources of his wealth from one of those men to whom london life for the last half century is like a book that they know by heart greswold yes of course i remember the fellow a money-lending lawyer gave good dinners and ruined half the young men upon town but he had his redeeming points never wanted you to take wine or pictures wouldn't look at anything but real property and was satisfied with thirty per cent per annum a long-headed old dog but you don't mean to say that old greswold is alive i haven't heard of him for the last five-and-twenty years he is living but in retirement you think he must be rich as croesus he has eaten up more landed estates than i have worn out boots he must be a millionaire to an enthusiast of lord hilliard's temper the idea of oliver's future means was full of attraction he had spent as much of his fortune as he could spend without leaving his only child too poorly provided for and he looked on all sides for funds with which to sustain work that had been begun but which was too apt to languish even after the most prosperous beginning 
for want of income. It was easy to kindle the flame of enthusiasm even in the worldly breast, but it was hard work to keep the fire burning. People told him that they were beginning to sicken at charity appeals. There were so many of them. It was impossible to help everybody. The indigent were nowadays the only people provided for. Everything was found for them. Free libraries, flannel petticoats, schools for their children, hospitals, convalescent homes, day in the country, winters on the Riviera. We can't get these luxuries, don't you know? We have to go without, says flippancy vexed at having the price of three pairs of evening gloves squeezed out of its lizard skin purse. Lord Hilliard had been called blind as a bat by those who saw the peril of Oliver's position in Hyde Park Gardens. But it may be that he was not unaware of the growing attachment between his daughter and his secretary, and that he beheld it with approval. He had infinite faith in the young man's character and capacity, and he had no doubt as to his future position. He did not commit himself to any promise. Indeed, Oliver, always reticent, had been careful to avoid any revelation to the father, although his hopes were known to the daughter. He told Violet that it was wiser to keep silence until his grandfather's death should place him in a position to ask for her hand. And Violet had consented to a secret engagement, knowing that her father liked and trusted the man she loved, and having no fear for the result. This was the state of affairs when Oliver was startled from his dream of bliss by an explosion of temper upon his grandfather's part, a burst of ill-humour, the cause of which was insignificant, but the result stupendous. For in this sudden fury the old man revealed the feeling of long years. "'Do you think I ever liked your puritanical visage, or relished your damned superior airs?' he cried. "'You were born a prig like your father before you. "'My God, I should have liked you better if you had been a profligate. "'And I'll be bound you are counting on making a mighty figure in the world with my money when I am underground. "'Your name will top every subscription list with three figures, "'and you'll be on the committee of every new-fangled scheme for pampering a pack of lazy swine. "'And you'll be wanting to pull down my tenement houses, which have paid twenty per cent for the last fifty years.' in order to build palaces that will cost you money out of pocket every year to keep up. That's the kind of use you'll make of my money, instead of turning your attention to the money market and developing into a great financier, as you ought to have done if you had been of my kidney. Don't be too sure of your chances. You are not the only piece of my flesh and blood. There is living somewhere, perhaps in dire poverty, while you are wallowing in luxury here, a child of the child I loved best of any mortal upon this earth, and who rewarded your love with the basest ingratitude, retorted Oliver, too angry to maintain his usual reserve. Oh, you have been told that story, have you? Yes, my daughter was ungrateful, a viper that I had warmed in my bosom. But who knows, if I could have looked forward and seen the long lonely years before me, I might have been weak enough to forgive the viper. I loved her, sir. I am capable of love, though you may not believe it. But I can't love a prig. This revelation of the feelings of a soured old man was like the lifting of a curtain, and Oliver did not rest until he had seen Morris Mortimer, and by dint of diplomatic promises, which amounted to something a little less than direct bribery, had obtained the particulars of his grandfather's latest will. The will had been made soon after Oliver left Cambridge, and at a time when his thoroughly respectable career under most adverse conditions ought to have won his grandfather's regard. A previous will, made when Oliver first came as a child under his grandfather's roof, left him everything. What in God's name have I ever done to forfeit my grandfather's good opinion? The young man exclaimed despairingly. Is it not a hideous injustice to him to prefer the child of a disobedient daughter, a creature he has never seen? He is a strange being, and his life has been a strange life ever since the girl kicked up her heels and left him. She was a beautiful girl, a brilliant, 
quick-witted hussy, and she could twist her father round her little finger. I suppose as he got older he took to brooding about the past. Old men do, you know. Lonely old men like your grandfather live more in the past than they do in the present. It is a hideous injustice, a hideous injustice, reiterated Oliver as he walked up and down the office white with anger. He could find no other phrase to qualify his grandfather's treatment of him. I have been brought up to rely upon this fortune. I have given all my thoughts and study to the future use of the money that now lies idle, a disgrace in a Christian country. I should use it for the benefit of my fellow man, not for luxury, not for self-indulgence, or for what the world calls pleasure, not for grouse moors, or yachts, or racing stables. The clothes I wear today, the dinner I eat today, would be good enough for me tomorrow if I were three times a millionaire. I have no sensuous longings, Mortimer, no lust for high living or dissipation. The woman I love is the noblest type of womanhood, my superior in character as she is my superior in station. My life lies smooth before me, a good life, a useful life, a noble life but it is dependent upon my inheriting that old man's wealth. If he cheats me out of that, he will cheat me out of everything. He flung himself into a chair and sobbed aloud, the first tears he had shed since he was told curtly enough of his mother's death. He remembered the day as if it were yesterday, a blazing July afternoon. He had been playing in the neglected garden, longing for a dog or a rabbit, any living creature to bear him company, when his grandfather came to him with a black-bordered letter in his hand. He remembered also the housemaid, who looked after him, had tried to comfort him with talk of his future riches, which he found him sobbing in his lonely little bed. And now the door was shut upon that brilliant future which he had believed in until today. "'You mustn't be so downhearted, my good fellow,' said the solicitor. I may tell you in confidence, as I am and always have been your true friend, that your grandfather has not been able to find out whether his daughter's only child, a girl whose birth and christening we know all about, and whom we were able to trace up to a certain point, is alive or dead. The chain snapped suddenly at Avra, where we found evidence of her mother's death some years before our inquiry. But beyond that place, we could find no indication of the girl or her father. It's as likely as not the girl is dead, or has gone to America, or the colonies, or has gone to the bad, and that even should she survive your grandfather, we may never hear any more of her. How long is it since your search ended? Five years. And has my grandfather been content to make no further effort? Well, to tell you the truth, Oliver, I have done all in my power to hinder any further search. You see, I have known you from a little lad, and up to the day I received instructions about the new will, I looked upon you as your grandfather's sole heir. So I was rather lukewarm about the search, and I, well, I confess, I employed a highly respectable private detective who can speak no language but his own, and who is about as intelligent as as the average detective. But there will have to be a further search made after my grandfather's death, of course, said Oliver. Yes, as his executor, it will be my duty to make inquiries, to advertise for the heiress. Frankly, Oliver, I hope the girl is dead, and that you will not lose the fortune to which you are fairly entitled. Oliver thanked him for his good wishes. If I do get my chance, you won't find me ungrateful, he said. He did not rest content with this information, and the search for the girl was begun again under new conditions. It was a secret search, and the man who was employed never knew the real name of his employer. Oliver Greswold had been able to save between forty and fifty pounds from the sums paid for his contributions to some of the better class of magazines. He could write well and vigorously upon subjects that he knew by heart, and while his pen had served the good cause, the earnings of that pen had been accumulating against some unlooked-for need. 
the money was just enough to pay the fees and expenses of the inquirer and within three months after his confidential interview with his grandfather's solicitor oliver greswold knew that the woman who was to deprive him of fortune and status and to spoil his chance of winning the girl he fondly loved had drifted to a garret in a dingy lodging-house in one of the shabbier streets of bloomsbury the transaction was completed the agent who had conducted the inquiry had placed the result before his client in black and white every link in the chain was there and there was no shadow of doubt that the mrs rayner living wretchedly in a third-floor bedroom in dynover street walking the dreary streets and squares night after night when all happy people were within four walls was the only child of ralph carford and the very lillian carford named in old greswold's will the agent had talked with mrs grogan and had heard all that there was to be told of her history and her habits her history a blank her habits eccentric but according to mrs grogan not vicious oliver greswold would not believe that story of eccentricity without vice of course she had fallen into vicious courses or if she had abandoned the ways of vice it was because vice had abandoned her he could think nothing but evil of her the offspring of a disobedient daughter and of a raffish adventurer one of those sprigs of a noble tree for whose species the hard-headed radical had ever felt a contemptuous dislike what good fruit could come of such a tree the girl had eloped with the first seducer who offered himself she had lived the usual life of such facile victims had dressed fine and eaten and drunk of the best and when abandoned by her first protector had found another on a lower grade as to means who could doubt what kind of life she had led when deserted in his turn by this second lover the woman at the lodging-house in dynover street would naturally in her own interests pretend that all her lodgers were immaculate but considering that the painted lady on the second floor was known to be a disreputable character it would have been childish credulity to accept mrs grogan's assurance that her third-floor lodger's midnight ramblings indicated only an innocent eccentricity no he had no doubt as to the character of the woman who was to supplant him this disreputable creature meagre hollow-cheeked and haggard of eye was to come between him and all those golden opportunities of goodness and greatness to which he had looked forward to ever since he had been able to think he told himself that there was nothing sordid or selfish in his aspirations were the fortune his thousands would share in its benefits every sovereign in the yearly income would mean something of comfort for some sufferer some lightening of the burden under which the weary shoulders and weak knees were daily bending he thought of the airy and healthful houses which would rise from the ruins of the greswold tenements houses that should offer advantages and comforts slowly planned and developed in the long hours of many a wakeful night discussed with architects and sanitary engineers houses which were to be the ultimate outcome of modern science in the housing of the poor he thought of himself in the house of commons as the people's advocate and all that he had of ambition and of vanity thrilled and pulsed in his veins as he pictured the triumphs that might reward so fiery an enthusiasm pleading a cause that so appealed to a universal sympathy but to plead successfully to be listened to and respected he must be known as a rich man who was devoting his fortune to the cause he advocated not as the penniless radical making capital of the common sorrows and sufferings would he have his voice heard in the senate house for success had ever been his loftiest dream he had turned his thoughts with contempt from every petty triumph from the applause of the mechanics institute or the drawing-room meeting to the foreshadowing of that future in which his voice should resound under the roof which had echoed the voices of ashley cobden and bright in the days when philanthropy was a new fashion and how would this woman use the wealth that was to be flung into her lap without experience of decent life without one reputable acquaintance 
how could she be expected to deal with a great estate she would eat it and drink it and fling it to the loose company that would gather about her swift as vultures sighting carrion the chances were that her brain would be turned by so sudden a change of fortune and that a year of wild enjoyment would end in a lunatic asylum champagne first perhaps and chloral afterwards would be the epitome of her miserable history a lover or two to cheat and bully her perhaps a husband to clutch the bulk of her estate and hasten her progress to the grave could money mean anything but accelerated ruin for such a human wreck as the cousin whose history he had been told and whose face he had seen he had often debated that question which modern thought has discussed as boldly as ever it was argued by antique philosophy is life worth living and here he argued was a case in which the answer was easy and decisive here in the person of lisa rayner was a life not worth living a life worthless to its possessor a life that could only exercise evil influences upon others a life which for him oliver greswold meant ruin and despair long days long nights of harrying thought resulted in a plan of action which began with daily practice in his grandfather's grounds and an occasional hour at a shooting gallery in soho End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of rough justice this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by mary herndon bell rough justice by mary elizabeth braddon chapter twenty one a new development at eight o'clock the wilverwold drawing-room looked as pleasant a place as the heart of man need desire for the focus or rallying point of home it was summer still though autumnal sport had begun summer tempered by autumn there were open windows which admitted the perfume of dijon roses while the red glow of a wood fire gave the suggestion of comfort which is wanting where the hearth is cold pleasant people were grouped about the pleasant room and the master of the house standing by lord hilliard's side upon the spacious persian hearth-rug seemed in no manner out of harmony with the brightness of his surroundings he was able to answer his wife's pathetic little look of interrogation as she crept to his side after welcoming her guest with a reassuring smile yes dear quite myself again you see how foolish it would have been to put people off i am so glad i am so happy her hand stole into his for a moment before she turned away wonderful recuperative power there lady violet said the american who had been watching her hard workers like your husband have that power sometimes in an extraordinary degree but he was just dead beat this afternoon he oughtn't to walk walking over a lumpy country isn't good enough for a man of his mental calibre it's a waste of nerve force and a wanton expenditure of blood that ought to be feeding his brain do you know how much blood the brain wants to keep it going lady violet i don't suppose you do nobody ever takes the trouble to consider what a glutton the brain is violet listened smilingly without hearing she was happy now her husband's face had recovered its habitual repose a thoughtful face always but with a look in the eyes when they met hers which brightened the whole countenance there was no lack of talk during dinner though the host himself was silent our friend is a speaker and not a talker somerville remarked to mrs armstrong oratory not conversation is his forte oh but i assure you he can talk splendidly upon his own subjects argued ida of course he can that is oratory conversation is the art of talking about everybody's subjects touch and go pitch and toss catching folly as it flies 
that's why your empty-headed man is generally the best dinner-table talker the night was unusually warm for the time of year and when the ladies were gone the men took their politics and their cigarettes out of the dining-room windows and into the coolness of a dewy garden somerville hooked his arm through oliver's and talked of his last peregrinations among the new york slums while armstrong and the vicar sauntered beside them and listened mildly interested arnold found himself alone with lord hilliard who walked slower than the younger men and who was in the expansive after-dinner mood common to men of his age and circumstances i dare say my son-in-law's work is rather out of your line mr wentworth he said when his cigar was fairly lighted but i hope you don't think him a bore or a faddist i hope you understand and appreciate his fine qualities and his capacity for work perhaps i admire him most as your disciple lord hilliard all the good he has done or is ever likely to do is the good you began in the dark ages well it was something to help in that beginning of things in the early forties there were just a few quiet people who cared for the poor but now humanity has become a universal passion and a fashion and in some cases the charity bazaar and amateur play section a fashion there is a rage for good works and the sacred cause of humanity is in some peril of falling into discredit by being overdone there are too many people playing at philanthropy you see wentworth they block the way of the workers but my son-in-law is no dilettante when i hand on my lamp to him i know that i pass it to a stronger runner than myself and he is in earnest he is terribly in earnest the work that he is now doing has been the dream of his life if he had been disappointed at last as there was some risk that he might be by his grandfather's perversity in preferring a granddaughter whom he had never seen to the grandson he had adopted and bred up from childhood if this unknown woman had come forward to claim the estate i think oliver's heart would have been broken he could scarcely have aspired to your daughter's hand in that case oh i don't know quite about that i am very fond of my daughter and i am not very fond of rank or of money i am by no means a flinty-hearted father wentworth but i have very little to give my only child you have had so many orphan children to provide for and if violet and her husband had depended upon me they must have been very badly off poor things he would have been cramped and fettered and most of his schemes would have come to grief for want of money however the cousin has not been heard of and i think we may make up our minds that the cousin is dead and the money which she might have spent weakly and foolishly or wickedly will be the redemption of hundreds of her downtrodden sex you mean that a great part of this fortune will be devoted to rescue work questioned arnold yes that is the work to which my son-in-law has given his greatest efforts within the last year he is an enthusiast but he has a cooler and clearer intellect than is often vouchsafed to enthusiasts and this passion for rescue work i take it is a new development in your son-in-law's career yes it is a new phase of usefulness his earlier efforts were concentrated upon one great work the proper housing of the poor all his noblest feelings were appealed to by the miseries of east end london as he saw them in his schoolboy wanderings a lonely friendless lad who had no home pleasures to distract his thoughts from suffering humanity the subject was brought nearer to him by the fact that his grandfather owned houses as wretched as any of the dens east of his city school he brooded on the miseries of the poor at an age when the average boy has no heavier care than a latin imposition or a debt at the tuck shop rescue work is a new development and he has taken it up with an intensity beyond any of his previous enthusiasms it is no longer the healthy housing of bodies remember it is the saving of souls for which he is now working his house of the women of samaria his home of st mary magdalene will give shelter and cure and new life and useful healthful work to hundreds of women 
now wandering painted spectres embodied miseries through our midnight streets i cannot in this casual talk describe the magnitude of the scheme to which he has been directing his energies from the hour that he succeeded to his grandfather's fortune but if he be spared to complete that work a task perhaps of many years of many years arnold echoed mechanically as if thinking aloud he will leave behind him a name that will rank with those of john howard and william wilberforce he will have brought light into the prison-house of sin he will have emancipated the slaves of vice you think his life a valuable one then lord hilliard a life of infinite value to suffering mankind and you are sure that he is in earnest that he will not slacken his efforts in the cause of humanity now that he has won your daughter and made his position in the world forgive me if i speak too plainly i am not afraid of plain speaking greswold is an exceptional man and the world is apt to doubt the sincerity of philanthropists i have no more doubt of him than i have of myself he has been my coadjutor for half a dozen years and i have never known him to flag or waver he has already engaged at least a third of his capital in the work he has at heart at the hazard of being called upon to reinstate every shilling in the event of his cousin still being alive oh you may be sure upon that point he must know there is no risk of that he has only negative evidence he knows that all efforts to find her were without result but he has no evidence of her death poor waif sighed arnold it is in remembrance of her perhaps that he is trying to save the wretchedest among her sisters it has occurred to me that such a feeling might influence him answered lord hilliard greswold might naturally say to himself here am i enjoying the fortune which would have belonged to this woman had she lived to claim it and not knowing what misery she may have endured for want of money while she lived or into what depths of degradation and sin poverty may have sunk her how can i make amends to the dead better than by saving the living i can fancy him arguing with himself after that fashion and then flinging himself as he has done with heart and mind and means and strength into the work father are you and mr wentworth going to prowl up and down the grass all night asked violet's gentle voice from the shadow of the veranda mr and mrs armstrong are waiting to wish you good night then i am wanted said arnold as he followed lord hilliard into the drawing-room where he found everybody in the act of departure he was silent during the drive home brooding over lord hilliard's words a life as useful to humanity as howard's or wilberforce's good done to hundreds perhaps to thousands for the ball set rolling will always find new hands to push it along a life of useful achievement a life a thousand times more valuable to humanity than mine can ever be i have no passion for good works don't know how to begin them instinctively passed by on the other side when my fellow traveller lies wounded in the dust my life measured against oliver greswold's a lucifer match against a star and yet i know that oliver greswold is capable of deliberate murder I know that with relentless footsteps and unfaltering hand he tracked his kinswoman to her doom watched and waited for his opportunity had months in which to waver and repent and yet held on inflexible in wickedness ruthless as satan could there be two sides to a man's character pity tenderness of heart sympathy with sorrow and sin an ardent desire to snatch brands from the burning and coexist with those feelings the power to take the life of a fellow creature who had never wronged him by so much as a word the life of an unoffending woman creeping along her melancholy way bowed down by the weight of her own humility but this woman humble unoffending had been the obstacle between the philanthropist and all he wanted in the world he had thought out the question perhaps had weighed the good and evil in his metaphysical scales and had persuaded himself that one desperate crime 
kicked the beam when weighed against a life and fortune devoted to good works. What, considered dispassionately, was the value of this woman's life? To herself, very little. To the world at large, nil. She had neither child nor friend. Fortune flung at her in her degradation and loneliness might only spell moral ruin. Some day she must die. The inevitable end that comes to all must come to her. A little sooner or a little later. What matter? All that is lovely in woman's life, beauty, chastity, youth, health, she had wasted. The ship was wrecked long ago. What matter how soon the shattered hulk sank under water? After this fashion mused Arnold, trying to follow another man's argument. The cruel, cruel murder. A victim so defenseless, so unoffending. But what of his own treatment of that victim, whose moral wreck was known to him, whose tenderness, whose divine instinct of love had saved him from suicide, and who had been his devoted companion through years of trial and poverty? He had left her when it served his purpose to try his fortune elsewhere. He had come back from his land of Beulah, a rich man, intent upon offering her a money compensation for all her sufferings in order to marry the girl he loved. He had come back to reward her martyrdom of patient waiting by the heartless confession of his inconstancy. She had turned from him heartbroken, and he had not relented. He had not called her back and cried, you shall be my wife and no other i bound myself to you for life when we parted and i will keep my word to have let her go crushed and despairing to have broken that promise made in their poverty and sorrow sealed with their mutual tears to have disappointed the hope that had sustained her through years of memory was not this as black a crime as murder was he a man to drag his fellow man's misdeeds to the light of the day to bring anguish unspeakable upon the devoted wife, the trusted father-in-law, that benevolent old man whose whole life had been spent in easing the burdens laid on other lives, who had a claim to pity and reverence equal to the saints of old. What mattered their virtues or their sufferings to him, Arnold Wentworth? Had the evidence against him been stronger, would Oliver Greswold have sacrificed himself to save an innocent man's life? No a thousand times no the philanthropist would have pursued his beneficent course the friend and helper of men leaving a great name behind him in the days to come many men many women would have been bettered by his existence but that one man would have gone under just as that one woman had died for his and the world's advantage this is how Arnold thought out the situation in the darkness and silence of a sleepless night after the friendly dinner at Wilverwold Park. End of chapter 21「Chapter 22 of Rough Justice – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Herndon Bell Rough Justice by Mary Elizabeth Braddon Chapter 22 The Enemy and Avenger The Lingfield party were to join Greswold and his American friend the day after the dinner at Wilverwold. The men for a morning over the heather and gorse, the women to meet them at the hut in time for luncheon. The party had been made up in the drawing-room at Wilverwold after dinner. Lawrence Somerville had been the chief mover of the plan, and had pleaded that his time in Yorkshire was nearly up, and that this might be his last chance of having a day's pleasure with them. He had been seated next Miss Freeland at dinner, and had contrived to keep her interested in his conversation. American novelist had taught her a great deal about America, and she was eager to ask questions and compare notes. Was life in the country really as simple and sweet as Miss Wilkins made it? Was Boston quite the Boston of Silas Lapham? And so on, and so on. Somerville's talk had charmed her into forgetfulness of Arnold's cruelty. 
he watched her furtively from the other side of the table and the pangs of jealousy were added to his burden of care perplexed anxious at war with himself yet with a fixed purpose in his mind he set out for the moor with armstrong and a keeper after a seven o'clock breakfast at which neither ida nor mary appeared ida's pink cotton frock flashed into the hall just as they were starting and she walked to the gate with them we shall meet you at lunch oh how pale and fagged you look mr wentworth just as if you had been awake all night i haven't done much in the way of sleep but the moorland air will set me up again be sure to bring us a good luncheon said the husband with a kiss for a full stop before he shut the gate luncheon was over and the cart was driving off with the game bags and with plates and dishes empty champagne bottles and all the machinery of the feast the keepers and dogs had lunched in the open and the cartridges had been removed from the guns greswold and his friends meant to shoot no more to-day there would be just time to walk quietly home to tea before evening closed over the faded heather and the autumn mist veiled the track across the moor there had been an air of happiness and high spirits during the meal which had harmonized with the popping of champagne corks and the rattle of knives and forks but all the talk and gaiety the quips and cranks and ripple of silvery laughter had been provided by four people out of the seven assembled there somerville armstrong ida and mary had done all the talking and all the laughter had been theirs and even of these four the mirth had not been quite genuine for mary's thoughts had been divided between a natural girlish sympathy with all things bright and pleasant and an aching anxiety about the man she loved he was sitting next to her to-day had indeed taken care to seize that position and in the midst of the laughter that followed one of somerville's stories he startled her by an unexpected address mary when you and the others are walking homewards i want you to give them the slip and come back here can you will you do it dear he said in a voice too low to be heard across the table but why i want you here half an hour after the rest have left except greswold he will stay here with me we have something to talk about and there will be something for you to hear will you do it mary you know i would do anything to please you it isn't a question of pleasing me it is a question of our future lives my fate and yours you'll come won't you yes i don't believe miss freeland heard a word of my story said somerville who had been watching these two mr wentworth might reserve his confidences for a more convenient time i don't suppose all the secrets he could tell are calculated for a picnic party mary blushed and arnold looked angry if we have lost a particularly choice example of american wit i dare say we shall stumble upon it some day in bret hart or mark twain he said the party broke up after this they had been sitting at lunch nearly an hour and a half the liberal temper of the new wife having permitted cigarettes with the coffee the men pulled themselves together explored the tobacco pouches to be sure of a provision for the journey home while the women put on jackets and gloves and all were in marching order lady violet headed the column with armstrong mary ida and the american following when these had left the hut greswold paused at the door waiting for arnold to precede him his keepers and servants had gone his wife and his guests were walking briskly away in the westering sunlight he was alone with arnold wentworth the man against whom he had been warned his wife and his friends were distant but hardly a hundred yards yet he felt as if he were abandoned and defenceless face to face with all the horror of his life suddenly while he waited looking at his guest interrogatively arnold clapped the door to locked it and put the key in his pocket and then stood with his back against the door facing greswold at last he cried i have waited for this chance and it has come murderer what are you braving about wentworth open the door and don't play the fool he tried to treat things lightly and bore the shock well 
his spare frame was drawn to its full height rigid as if made of iron his thin lips were tightened into a straight line all that was hard and daring in his character expressed itself in his face but the ashen pallor of that face the drops that stood like dew upon his forehead the wild despair in his eye were so many confessions of guilt no innocent man surprised by an inexplicable accusation ever hung out that white flag of surrender you don't know who i am or why i am here you know me as wentworth a good-for-nothing chap who has made a little money in south africa and is loafing about in a harmless good-natured way and has been brought by chance to your door that's what you thought of me perhaps oliver greswold when you gave me your casual hospitality you were wrong it was no chance that brought me to your door i come as an enemy and avenger i am the man wentworth alias wildover who stood in the dock at bow street to answer for your crime to answer for the life you took you are the stronger man and i can't stop your raving still the cold dew oozed from the pallid forehead and the eyes were still widened with agony carry himself as he might with a careless shrug of his shoulders a contemptuous motion of his head the inward agony of the man showed itself in outward signs that were unmistakable one thought and one name were in his mind wife violet what would she not suffer if the evil he had done were brought home to him he had won her as it were with a cast of the devil's dice and if she were to know that he had bartered his soul to win her she who believed in souls in heaven everlasting reward and everlasting punishment her heart would break violet violet the dear name repeated itself in the confusion of his brain he scarcely knew what arnold was saying to him though his eyes were fixed upon the speaker's face and though he seemed to be listening you gained fortune wife fame and station by a cruel murder i stood in your place in the dock and left the court with a stain upon my life had not poverty compelled me to sink my real name this stigma might have broken my mother's heart it was dark enough to part me from the woman i loved i would offer myself to no pure-minded woman where there was doubt as to my guilt i waited for you the guilty man to remove that stain the time has come for you to do it he took a folded sheet of foolscap paper from his breast pocket a little ink bottle such as the collecting clerk might carry and a pen he laid the paper on the table and placed the ink bottle and pen beside it all this was done rapidly the instant it was done he resumed his post of vantage against the door i came prepared for business you see i didn't expect to find a shooting lodge provided with stationery sit down and write as i dictate stand away from that door I am not the kind of man to be trifled with or to humor a madman mad or sane you have to reckon with me one of us will have to knock under if you want to leave this house alive you'll have to write a confession of your guilt make it as short as you like but it must be plain enough for the woman i love to understand greswold looked round the hut the guns were gone there was no weapon within reach not even a poker on the hearth for there had been no fires burnt yet and nothing had been provided against winter weather he looked at arnold he was armed perhaps carried a revolver or a bowie knife in his pocket the man of civilization who had never lived out of london till now was prepared for any act of violence from this south african adventurer gold digger ruffian who for years had held his life at a moment's purchase you came here prepared for violence he said you were armed no doubt no i came here to meet you on equal terms man against man clean hands against hands dyed in blood you needn't look at the window noticing greswold's swift sudden glance that way i shan't let you out of this hut till you have written that paper then it comes to a question of brute force broad shoulders against narrow six foot two against five foot ten fourteen stone or thereabouts against nine call it so 
I mean you to write your confession. And you mean to hang me with it. No, I have no hunger for that kind of vengeance. I don't care a jot what becomes of your miserable carcass, for I know there is something inside it. Mind, memory, conscience, blue funk, call it what you like, that must prevent you ever knowing a happy day. I want one woman in the world, the woman I love, to know that you were the man who murdered Lisa Rayner. When you have made that clear to her, she will be here presently to witness your deposition. I care no more what becomes of you than I care what becomes of the bats that are skimming past that window as we stand here talking. Then it is not for the dead woman's sake you have hunted me down, not a vendetta for love of her, not for your old mistress. No. The wrong I did her is a wrong that no penalty you can pay could lessen or atone. She lies in her grave. I might have kept faith with her, and I broke it. I might have made her happy, and I didn't. I know my sin. No punishment inflicted upon you can lessen that. Come, sit down and write. I, Oliver Greswold, declare myself the murderer of Lisa Rayner. You are a fool or a madman to suppose that even brute force would extort such a confession from an innocent man. Oh, you still deny your guilt. That is a detail. You have to exculpate me by that acknowledgment. You have to reckon with a desperate man whose life's happiness is at stake and who won't stick at trifles. If you refuse to do what I want, only one of us shall leave this place alive. You can guess which that one will be. Will you write? He sprang forward, laid his hand on Greswold's shoulder, forcing him into a sitting position. The hand of the man whose thews and sinews had been braced by years of rough open-air life weighed like iron upon the town-bred student's slender frame. The man who had cultivated brain at the expense of body bent like a reed under that firm grip. Greswold dipped the pen in the ink and sat for a minute or so, deliberating, calculating his chances. Should he try his strength against this man, fight for his life and lose it? Let himself be found brutally murdered, skull battered, limbs broken, in a fight with a savage foe, or strangled by that iron hand which was now pressing on his shoulder? If he had the fortitude to accept such a doom, his wife would never know him for the wretch he was, and the man who killed him might swing for that brutal murder. This was the nobler course, the only manly course, but this meant surrender and death, and that long vista of a fair and honored life, the love that was his, the wealth and power that he had bought with that one crime, all must go, and instead of these would come that dreary end which he had never dared contemplate, annihilation. His quick imagination fancied himself lying at his adversary's feet, breath ebbing, sight fading, and in his brain but one thought. Life, life, life. The worst, the most degraded life is better than death. If to avoid a struggle in which I must be worsted, I write the confession you ask, will you swear that it shall not be used against me, most of all, that my wife shall never see it or be told. I want it for the sake of one woman. When she has seen it, I shall be satisfied. Mary Freeland? Mary Freeland. How do I know that she will keep the secret? You must trust her as you trust me. I cannot promise for her. I know that she is generous, kind, compassionate. If it comes within the limit of her charity to pity a cold-blooded murderer, she may pity you. For your wife's sake, I think she will deal mercifully with you, as I shall. And now, let there be no more talk. The confession has to be written. So be it. You are master of the situation. He began to write, slowly, with a hand that moved steadily along the paper, and he spoke the words in clear, unfaltering tones as he wrote them. I confess that with a deliberate purpose, and under the belief that I was justified in suppressing a useless life, which blocked my way to a career of benevolence and usefulness, and in the interest of the many as against the few, 
I shot my cousin Lillian Carford, alias Lisa Rayner, on the morning of Christmas Day, 1890. A light knock at the door startled him as he wrote the date. Stay, cried Arnold, unlocking the door. Here is my witness. You shall sign in her presence. Greswold's whole manner had changed after he had taken up the pen. The livid countenance, the ghastly horror of the man who unexpectedly faces death, had changed to a pale resolve which was not without dignity. The man who had made his own law of life, and who had feared neither God nor devil, reasserted himself. He looked up at Mary Freeland with a cynical smile upon his lips. "'This paper has been written for your satisfaction, Miss Freeland. I don't know whether Mr. Wentworth has prepared you for its contents. It is not an everyday document.' Mary looked at him in blank astonishment, and then looked from him to Arnold. Her hair had been blown about by the evening wind upon the moor, and her face was pale with anxiety. "'I don't understand,' she said. "'You will understand.' when you have read that paper which Mr. Greswold is going to sign in your presence. You will read it while the ink is wet. You will have no doubt that his hand wrote it. And then, without looking at the writer, Arnold pointed to the blank space below the written lines. Sign, he said. Greswold, that cynical smile still upon his bloodless lips, signed his name in full with an untrembling hand. He was thinking what weight such a document might carry in a criminal court, whether, if he declared that it was written to appease a homicidal maniac, there might not be people to believe him. For the rest, it was written because he could not help himself, and again his thoughts went back to that one image which filled his heart, the only being he had ever loved. Violet, my wife. Read, said Arnold handing the paper to Mary. She took it from him mechanically, with a bewildered air, and again her gaze wandered from one face to the other, her eyes questioned each in turn. Read, read, Arnold repeated impatiently. She read, and the new horror grew into her face. She looked at Greswold, a look of loathing, dropped the paper as if it had been an adder, and then flung herself upon Arnold's breast, clinging to him as in a wild terror of some monstrous creature never seen before. "'Do you understand, Mary?' "'Yes. Yes, I understand. I knew you were innocent. I have known it ever since that one miserable day when I let you leave me in my misery. But I never suspected. How could I have ever thought?' "'That such respectability as Oliver Greswold's could stain its fair record by murder? No, you never thought. The world would be slow to believe. He stopped to pick up the paper which Mary had dropped at his feet. I am going to give this man's confession into your keeping, Mary. It holds the hazard of his life, or almost the certainty of an ignominious death. Will you promise to keep the secret? It is meant for your knowledge only. No good can come of the world's knowing. One life cannot buy back another. And I, too, have been a sinner. I, too, have to suffer remorse. And there are others who would have to suffer for his crime if it were known. It is better, as I think, that he should escape than that those innocent ones should suffer. For these reasons, Mary, I have pledged my word to him that his secret shall rest between you and me. I promise, she said, as you hope to be saved urged Greswold, as I hope for mercy, and as I believe in the merciful God. She kept her eyes averted from his face, even while she addressed him, as if she wanted never to look upon that face again, and then she took the paper to the window, and read the lines again by the waning light, slowly and thoughtfully this time. "'Have you any matches, Arnold?' "'Plenty.' "'Light one, please.' He obeyed her, guessing her purpose, and held the match while she lighted the paper. "'For your wife's sake,' she said, addressing Greswold, but not looking at him. A guttural sound that might have been a stifled sob came from the man who sat at the table, and who had not stirred since he signed the paper. 
Mary held the paper till two-thirds of the sheet were burnt, and then let it flutter blazing to the ground. No vestige of the writing remained after Arnold had set his foot upon the blackened ashes. "'You have got off very cheap, Mr. Greswold,' he said, "'for your wife's sake. I leave you to your conscience and your God. Come, Mary.' He drew her trembling hand through his arm and led her out of the hut. Neither of them turned on the threshold for one last look at the stricken wretch who sat there, cowed and broken, his head bent, his face hidden, his dry lips dumbly shaking one of those cries of self-abasement so familiar to him in the years of his probation, when his grandfather's harsh voice, in biting winter mornings or the oppressive heat of a London summer, made the language of the psalmist a weariness and a disgust. The terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. I sink in deep mire, where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters, where the floods overflow me. But I am a worm, and no man a reproach of men, and despised of the people. The words came back to him in a wave of agony, words his unheeding ear had heard so often that they had sunk into his memory unawares. The mists of evening were rising from tarn and bog when Arnold and his sweetheart left the hut to walk to Lingfield. They had walked about a mile when they met a dog-cart driven by one of the Wilverwold grooms, who stopped to inquire about his master. Lady Violet was alarmed by Mr. Greswold not having overtaken her, the man told them, and had sent the cart for him. "'I hope there's nothing amiss, sir,' added the groom, who was an old servant of Lord Hilliard's, and had broken Lady Violet's first pony. "'No, there's nothing wrong. You'll find your master at the hut.' The dog-cart passed them half an hour later on their homeward way, the groom still driving, his master sitting beside him. Arnold and Mary stood and watched that drooping head and bowed figure as the cart vanished in the thickening mists. "'Will he tell his wife?' she asked. "'Not he. The shock was a rough one, and he may be some time getting over it. But he will take his secret to the grave with him. If we are silent, Lady Violet will never know.' I don't suppose she'll have a happy life with him. He's made of hard stuff, but even he won't escape the worm that dieth not, and the fire that is not quenched. And she will discover sooner or later that in the midst of prosperity and domestic love, and the world's respect, he is about as miserable a wretch as ever walked the earth. His malady will be called nerves, spinal disease, tumor, anything the most distinguished medical guessers choose to call it but his malady will be the deathless worm and the unquenchable fire, and his victim will be amply avenged. He told her briefly the story of the murder. She had no thought to-night of anything else, not even for happiness, and the knowledge that the man she loved belonged to her henceforward, and that all she had ever hoped for in life was to be hers. In England or in Africa, in poverty or in wealth, it mattered to Mary Freeland nothing how her days were to be spent, so long as they were spent with him. No word of love was spoken between them that night. It would have seemed horrible to expatiate upon their own happiness after that scene in the hut. But the next day, and the next, and for all the days Arnold spent at Lingfield, love was their only theme. Love and love's fruition. The happy days that were coming for them with the coming year. They were to be married at Lingfield Church on the first anniversary of Wilmot and Ida's wedding. "'We shall run the show,' said Ida, who had adopted all her husband's slang phrases. "'We are quite old married people now, you see.' In order that nobody's sensibilities should be outraged, Mary was to return almost immediately to the sheltering wing of Mrs. Tresillian Smith and the Worth and the docet of South Kensington and West Brompton were to be set to work on the young lady's trousseau. A modest little trousseau, in which provision was to be made for a long honeymoon in South Africa, where Arnold was to take his wife over that Tom Tiddler's ground 
on which while other men were laying the foundations of gigantic fortunes he had esteemed himself lucky in securing a competence before mary left lingfield she had to undergo an unexpected ordeal in an interview with lawrence somerville who solemnly warned her against the man to whom she had engaged herself a man who had stood in the dock at bow street as a suspected murderer i know all about that mary answered quietly but you see i knew arnold wentworth years and years before he stood in the dock as alfred wildover and i knew or i ought to have known she hesitated at this point remembering those dreadful hours of doubt that he was no more capable of murder than i am somerville sighed i think you might do better for yourself miss freeland a young lady of your remarkable attractions than to marry a man who had ever occupied that dubious position and then he told her that he had never admired any woman as he admired her never had known what love meant till he met her she stopped him as quickly as she could don't pray don't she exclaimed you are so kind and clever and altogether nice and i can't bear to pain you but i have been in love with arnold ever since i was twelve years old i was wearing pinafores when i began to adore him that will do miss freeland you're as straight as a die the man you love is a man the president of the united states may envy but i'm out of the running i shall go back to new york on the next boat life hasn't been very lively at wilverwold since you dined there that night is there anything wrong greswold is too full of his rescue work to be good company beside the domestic hearth he's a remarkable man miss freeland his ideas are in advance even of ours and he's sure to do a great work if he lives but he's not a lively companion and his wife is over anxious about him watches every shadow that crosses his face watches his plate to see if he eats his glass to see if he drinks looks miserable when he is out of the room for half an hour wants to keep him in sight when she is talking with her visitors a perfect wife but a shocking bad hostess so i shall cross in the next boat good-bye miss freeland the wedding at lingfield's church was all that is rustic and pretty in a country wedding even though there was no glory of summer roses to brighten the grey walls and outshine the old glass in the chancel window it was not by any means a smart wedding and it passed unrecorded in the society papers but what can any bride desire more than to be completely happy and mary's happiness was too deep for words i have always loved him she whispered when mrs wentworth who had come all the way from suffolk to assist at the ceremony hugged her in the vestry while the fateful book was being signed and i have always loved you dear and always wished for this day and i hope you will soon be tired of africa and come and settle down in your pretty house at mervyn hall i will go wherever arnold likes and live wherever he can be happiest said the bride being of the worshipping and upward-looking order of brides long since voted old-fashioned lady violet and her husband were in egypt when mary freeland was married they had left wilverwold for london early in november and had left london in a p and o steamer for alexandria at the advice of a famous specialist whom violet persuaded her husband to see the specialist pronounced greswold a sufferer from mental strain no doubt the result of prolonged overwork take him to the land of the pharaohs my dear lady and let him bask in egyptian sunshine and not write so much as a single letter or read one if you can help it till you bring him back in the spring so valuable a life as mr greswold's must not be jeopardized he has a frame of iron slight as he looks a will of iron too i fancy heart and lungs are undamaged all he wants is rest and the capacity to enjoy life a capacity which a good many hard workers lose and they don't know till they have lost it what a valuable quality it is lady violet and her husband are at cairo but all his plans for the help and comfort of his fellow-creatures are going on apace during his absence the home of st mary magdalen 
the house of the woman of samaria are full of human brands snatched from the burning the workmen's dwellings which he had planned exercising in many details and intelligence and an inventive power that have gone beyond the trained abilities of architects and sanitary engineers are rising skyward solid commodious and not unbeautiful eagerly competed for by the most respectable of the working classes and everywhere among the people who try to leave the world better than they found it the name of oliver greswold commands admiration and respect End of Rough Justice